Hi, I'm Eleanor Wachtel. Welcome to the 26th edition of the Blue Metropolis International Literary Festival in Montreal from April 25th to 28th, 2024. Today, I'm delighted to present part of the online festival with my special guest, actor, screenwriter, and director, Sarah Pauly. From child performer to award-winning filmmaker, her recent work is a powerful collection of personal essays called Run Towards the Danger, now translated into French by Madeleine Stratford and published by Boreal as Pour Vers le Danger. Sarah Pauly is a phenomenon. Really, I could spend a big chunk of time just listing all of the movies and TV shows that she's starred in, from The Adventures of Baron Munchausen to Road to Avonlea, from to the sweet hereafter, to my life without me. The directors that she's worked with, from Terry Gilliam to Hal Hartley and Catherine Bigelow, and the awards and honors she's received, really too many to name. And then there's her work as a political activist and director in her own right. I have to admit that for a while there, I was sure that she was older than she is simply because she's done so much. But to focus for a moment on her filmmaking, when she was 20, she wrote, directed, and co-produced a short feature. Two years later, her live action short, I Shout Love, won a Genie Award. When she was 25, she made her fifth film, an adaptation of a Carol Shields short story, The Harp. Then in 2006, age 27, she wrote and directed Away From Her, an adaptation of Alice Munro's story, The Bear Came Over the Mountain. The movie was nominated for two Oscars, Best Adapted Screenplay and Best Actress for Julie Christie. It won six genies, including Best Film, Best Director, and Best Adapted Screenplay, plus the award for Best First Feature. Roger Ebert called it a heartbreaking masterpiece. Sarah Pauly was invited to sit on juries at Cannes and Sundance, and Variety named her one of the 10 directors to watch. Her next feature, Take This Waltz, and her documentary, The Stories We Tell, were each named one of Canada's top 10 features of the year. In fact, Stories We Tell was included in the top 10 Canadian films of all time and won the $100,000 Best Canadian Film Prize, as well as the New York Film Critics Circle Award. In 2017, she produced and wrote the screenplay adaptation of Margaret Atwood's Alias Grace for a Netflix CBC television miniseries. It was a novel that Sarah had first tried to option when she was 17. Last year, her adaptation of Miriam Taves's novel, Women Talking, which she wrote and directed, was nominated for Oscars, including Best Picture, and Sarah won for Best Adapted Screenplay. Alongside all this, Sarah Pauly has been writing intense personal essays, gutsy, honest, and complex, that probe her past, often mediated through her body, through her own body, and threats to it through circumstance or illness. The book is called Run Towards the Danger, and it's subtitled Confrontations with a Body of Memory. It's my pleasure to speak to Sarah Pauly. Uh -huh. Maybe I should start at the end and say, and ask you, how did winning the Oscar for Best Adapted Screenplay change your life? Um, it mostly just added confusion. <laughs> I mean, it was really great moment. I was really happy it happened and um, and really thrilling. But it it just sort of it, it. I think, you know, people report this, that the year after you win an Oscar is a strange time. And I think it's because you have a lot of opportunities. And then there's also the reason you started doing what you do and trying to find some grounding and some perspective on what you should be doing next, um, as opposed to just chasing after opportunities that maybe aren't directions you would have ever gone in. So that's how it's changed my life. It's made me kind of scattered. <laughs> <laughs> and I've always been kind of focused and I've never been a procrastinator, but that seems to be a new quality. Oh, a new, a new side. And yeah. we're where do you keep the Oscar? I don't see it behind you anywhere in your, in your no, office. I haven't seen it really since I brought it home. My kids steal it from each other and hide it in their rooms. And I, I think I've seen, I've caught a glimpse of it once or twice, but it's mostly somewhere hiding in a kid's room. Well, I remember about six years ago when we were talking about one of your adaptations away from her, uh, adapted from a story by Alice Munro. And you said that the first screenplay that you ever wrote was about a child actor. Can mm -hmm. you tell me about that? Yeah, it was a story of a child actor on a kid's show, and it sort of almost had magic realism aspects to it. And it was about 
um, you know, a kid being in an environment that was inappropriate for them, exposed to things they didn't quite understand, assuming the mannerisms and postures of an adult without necessarily knowing what those things meant. Um, so it really, it was a story, I guess, about a kid who was in danger, but also about a kid who was slowly becoming a monster through this curious mixture. And I talk about it in my book of, of coddling and neglect, which I think is what creates the kind of monstrosity we see in so many child performers is on the one hand, you're you're coddled, nobody, everybody laughs at your jokes, nobody tells you when you're not behaving well. And on the other hand, you're really being utilized and um, people are sort of instrumental in their relationship with you. You're being worked probably longer and harder than you should. People want something from you. So it's a concoction. So I was sort of looking at that. I didn't end up making it for all kinds of reasons. The, the main reason was Telfilm just turned it down about 20 times. But, but I am <laughs> actually in the end... And I don't want to give Telfilm any credit for this, but I am glad that wasn't my first film in the end. And in a way, I'm, I'm not sure how I would have made it because I would have been putting a child in a leading role in a film, which would be full of all of the same pitfalls, no matter how careful I was. Because I know it was it was rejected and it was it, it resided in a drawer for a while. But you and you, you acknowledge that. Oh, actually, I should first say, why do you think it was rejected so many times? So the time that I was going up for financing... Um, there was uh, an amazingly toxic brew of um, commercial obsession and misogyny within telefilm in terms of the leadership. And I experienced that firsthand over and over and over again. So it was a time when uh, there was this decision it was going to be all about box office. It was during the Sturzberg era. So it going to be all about box office and bottom line. It was made clear to me that even though I was you know, 22 or 23, I represented the old guard <laughs> of Canadian <laughs> film. And, you know, Adam McGoin was my executive producer. And there was this very overt, um, you know, declaration over and over again that we're not doing that anymore. We're not about making movies that go to Cannes. We're about making movies that, you know, bring in tons of box office receipts. And so it was it was rejected a few times, each time more humiliating than the last. And in the end, it became really clear to me that under that regime, I just would simply not get a film made. And then there was a new regime and it was more friendly. And I had a new script that I think was, uh, I think Away From Her was less challenging um, for people. And I had a few people within the Toronto office that really went to the mat for the film and really staked their job on because I think I was about to be turned down again. And I think, so, you know, I had a couple of, of champions, but really I was very, very close to giving up. Because, hmm. I mean, you acknowledged that, that that initial screenplay was clearly autobiographical. And, and, uh, but, and in fact, three of the pieces in this book, that is half, are about your experience as a child actor. The, the Adventures of Baron Munchausen, directed by Terry Gilliam, uh, in the enormously popular CBC TV series The Road to Avonlea and on stage in Alice Through the Looking Glass at Stratford and, and and we'll talk about these but was it kind of a natural segue that from that screenplay to these essays or I mean how did you come to turn this yeah. material into something so overtly personal? Yeah I mean I think ultimately that's what I've sort of landed on that that's the way to talk about these things you know I think it's really hard to use a child to help illustrate how awful it is for child actors, no matter how conscious you are. So I think these were stories that were sort of brewing in me to articulate at some point. I think at some point I thought I might write a novel that was based on that screenplay. And then ultimately, you know, I had started writing these essays and fits and starts over the years and that it became clearer and clearer that, you know, there's a lot of experiences that you want to kind of translate into art or into films or into books. And this was one of those experiences that just needed to be talked about really directly. In, in your chapter, Mad Genius, you describe your experience working on Terry Gilliam's The Adventures of Baron Munchausen. I mean, you were only eight when you were cast as Sally Salt, the, the Baron's young sidekick. What made it so traumatic for you? I mean, it was it was a set that a lot of people felt very unsafe. On. So lots of people have talked about and written about their experiences, but I was obviously the littlest person there. So there were a lot of special effects, lots of explosives, lots of extremely long days, lots of being in cold water for long periods of time. It was a production that was objectively out of control. It was shut down for a few weeks. Um, 
And, you know, at the helm of it, you know, the title of the essay is Mad Genius, was a mad genius. And I think this is a kind of archetype that we've really celebrated and um, lifted up, you know, for as long as I can remember, this idea of this usually male, out of control, kind of loose canon of a genius who we all just kind of blindly follow because we know they're making great art. We can't possibly understand their process and possibly this terrible, crazy behavior is part of that process, but we're privileged enough to be a part of it. Um, so, you know, the the essay is really about looking at that and questioning whether that kind of behavior, behavior and lack of safety for people making a piece of art is ever necessary and if it's ever additive. Um, and so, yeah, it was, it was scary because um, Terry was like a big kid, you know, managing a really, really big production with huge logistics and animals and kids and tons and tons of background performers and explosives and people in, hot, in cold water tanks and um, things got out of control. Um, and sometimes in very, very scary ways with explosives going off too close to me and to others um, and involving trips to the hospital. So it was just objectively an unsafe environment. And I understand in terms of the context, but why do you think your your parents, for instance, were, were unable to protect you? Or is that just part of the world of child actors, that the framework, the the uh, the implicit coercion of, of of the business? I think it's really, really hard for parents to stand up in front of a huge machinery, like a film set with hundreds of people, all of whom are professionals and you know, who presumably most people would be in awe of and say, stop this doesn't feel safe for my kid. I think that's actually a much harder thing to do than it sounds. Um, so I think over the years, I've become more understanding of what that would have taken when you're being reassured, everything's safe, everything's safe. Um, but I think also the parents of kids in film are people who are almost always in some way awed by the filmmaker. I mean, they're their kids are there for a reason. It, it, you don't just slip into this, you seek it out. So I think, you know, even though I've met some great parents of kids on sets, in general, I think they're going to be more easily pressured or influenced to put their kids in situations that the rest of us might instinctually freak out about because it's, you know, for the purposes of being part of something really, really exciting. Um, so, and, and your parents were huge fans of, of parents were huge fans of Terry Gilliam. Yeah. And and also, you know, and I and I share this with as I get older, I share this with my mom, so I'm much less judgmental of it. You know, a real fear of conflict, a real fear of being the difficult one, a real people pleaser. It's very, very hard to get shouty and stand up for the right thing alone when you have those qualities, even when it's your kid. So um, I don't feel the amount of judgment I used to feel. But yeah, was I in unsafe situations that I should have been pulled out of? Absolutely. Um, and I would do that with my kids, but only because I only know that because I've had the experience of being on the other end of it. I'm not confident I would know how to do that if I hadn't. Years later, you wrote to Terry Gilliam about what you'd experienced during the shoot. Uh, did you, did, did you, well, I should say, did you get satisfaction or just like what happened? I mean, do, do we always excuse the mad genius? I mean, it's funny, you know, you know, people have such varying responses. I mean, I remember I got the email back from him and I was just so delighted he responded. So was it a perfect response? No, of course not. Um, but it wasn't as defensive and hostile as it could have been. And for that, I was really grateful. Um, there are ways in which he takes responsibility in his email back and ways in which he doesn't um, and wonders if some of it is in my imagination or, you know, my memory that, um, but I think the fact that he's willing to engage on these things puts him way ahead of a lot of people on this front. So he's willing to have the really hard, ugly conversation. He's willing to have it in public. He also agreed to let me publish his emails in a mm. newspaper when we had that email exchange. And I, I just think we're in a culture of such fear around looking bad or being dragged that the one thing I can say I really respect about him is his willingness to have a public dialogue. Do I you know, side with him or agree with him or sympathize him with on most things? Probably not. He said some really awful, offensive things over the last few years in my mind, but I really- Not, not in relation to you or anything. Not right? even in relation to me, no, in relation things, to like, yeah. you know, feminism or, you know, drives for diversity. I mean, he just says 
stupid shit all the time, but like he says it and a lot of people are thinking it. And I'd rather like someone expose themselves than us be guessing and then be wily and strategic. So there's always that that I'll admire about him. He was, you know, in a way as a kid, he was a great playmate. I mean, he wasn't a screamy, you know, strict director. And I encountered them as well, like people who objectively didn't like and shouldn't have been around kids. He wasn't one of those. He was like a big kid with a huge set of amazing toys that he shouldn't have been left alone with. You know, it was just like there weren't any parents. <laughs> That's right. Where were his parents when you needed them? Yeah. <laughs> As a child actor, the the role you're probably most identified with, uh, one that you played for six years from age nine to 15 or so, it was young Sarah Stanley in The Road to Avonlea. I mean, this was the highest rated show in Canada at the time, topping Hockey Night in Canada. This chapter of your of your life, a sizable chunk of your childhood and early adolescence, you've said that it haunts you. In in what way? I think it's a really. I mean, I'm, I have kids who are going through puberty now, so the idea puberty's hard enough, you know, without you know the country watching you. Um, and you know, my mom died in the middle of the show, so and I was living alone with my dad in squalor. There was neglect. I had a pretty isolating, unhappy life at the time. So, you know, I was doing that. And then I was sort of in this glare of this spotlight in this very happy family show where I was sort of expected to put on a smiley, happy, pretty face a lot of the time publicly, which, you know, I didn't do. <laughs> I was so miserable. Um, but I I think it was just really complex on a lot of levels. I worked very long hours. I was working under a contract that I don't believe was legal at the time where I could work any amount of overtime as long as I was paid. Um, and, you know, they incorporated crime scenes about my mother dying shortly after my mother died. I mean, there was, it was not a great, was not a great experience on most levels. Yeah, I know. I mean, when I, you, you, with the way you describe it in, in your book, that when your mother died during the series, you returned to set a week later and you were soon forced to perform grief for your character's dead mother who had died years earlier, but suddenly it was brought back into the story. I mean, it's hard to imagine anyone thinking that would be good for you. No, I, I mean, I think what they were thinking is that they'd get a great performance and they were right. It was my best work. Um, but what it did do was sort of interrupt a grieving process that remained. So it was, you know, decades before I could actually cry about my mother dying because the first time I had done it was to produce tears for a TV show. Um, yeah, I mean, things like that, which were, were just, but ultimately, you know, it's, you're putting kids in an environment where their experience and their development or well-being is not the priority. The priority is either making the best thing possible or making money. There are a million um, objectives that are far more pressing on a film or TV set than a kid's. And so I think inevitably these things happen to one degree or another. Um, and sometimes they're smaller and sometimes they're really big, like some of the stuff that happened to me, but I haven't heard too many former child actors rave about the experience of being child actors. You've, you've described yourself as a, as a romantic child at one time with, with romantic longings. And was that gone for good by the time you finished that role? I mean, after, the loss of your mother and your really essentially interrupted childhood? I think it was gone for a while until I had my own kids and got to kind of see the world through their eyes. I think that I got really cynical. Um, I also saw, you know, the, you know, as I was becoming more and more aware, 12 and 13, seeing the hierarchies on a film set where the people at the bottom of the ladder who tended to know the most and have the most experience were the worst paid, the least respected. The people at the top were kind of like people who kind of waltzed on and off, affected other people's lives tremendously with their casual decisions. And so watching that kind of hierarchy and the treatment of certain people versus other people, I think was the beginning of like also a political consciousness in me. Um, and I was like pretty angry. Yeah, by the time I was 15, I I had, you know, I think rightly seen that there was massive unfairness and injustice and that people were capable of exploiting each other and not caring about each other. And um, so I think it was a long time before that sense of wonder 
came back and that sense of beauty. And I, I do think that that was a huge result of having my own kids who kind of came to everything fresh. That was a couple of decades later, though. Mm -hmm. Memory and, and how it works is, is one of the preoccupations of your book, Run Towards the Danger. It's also a theme in, in, in some of your films, such as Away From Her and, you know, the, your adaptation of the Alice Monroe story and your, your documentary Stories We Tell. Is it the slipperiness of memory? It's unreliability that interests you or the way it's refracted over time? Or how do you see it? Um, I mean, I'm always fascinated by the way people remember stories differently. I mean, even yesterday, there was a, an incident that happened in my kid's classroom that was kind of a big deal for all of them. And it's so funny being on the parent chat, right? Everyone has a completely different story from their kid, which you know they're they're actually quoting probably as verbatim as they can. And it's like this thing, because it was a big deal, because it impacted people, is going to be filtered through in memory the impact it had on each specific person, what the meaning of that is, how it is in dialogue with the rest of their life and who they are and what they believe and what their values are. And, and then we're so kind of confident, you know, about our own memories. And I mean, I, I know when I made stories we tell, it was so fascinating to have to shut up with your own family. You know, like usually if someone tells a story wrong in your family, you're going to jump on, jump in and correct them, which means you never actually hear the full narratives anyone's carrying around. And so I had this amazing opportunity to just be quiet and listen. And, and the narratives that people had were so different from each other. And they were all so confident. They were as confident as I was about my narrative, which had nothing to do with anybody's. Um, so I think we just always have like a translation and a language problem that we don't even know about when we're in relation to any other human being in terms of what an experience is or how we've interpreted or what our memory of it is. And so I'm just kind of fascinated by how we navigate that and how complicated that is. But it seems to be exacerbated when the memories that you're probing are difficult or painful or, I mean, I mean, near the end of the of your essay about your experience in the movie, The Adventures of Baron Munchausen, you have this powerful observation, which which I'd, I'd like to quote. I mean, you say, so much of coming to terms with hard feelings from the past seems to be about believing our own accounts, having our own memories confirmed by those who were there and honored by those who weren't. Why is it so hard for us to believe our own stories or begin to process them without corroborating witnesses appearing from the shadows of the past or with people stepping forward with open arms when echoes of those stories present themselves again in the present, this paragraph. I mean, why is it so hard? I mean, how, how would you answer that? I mean, I, I'm not sure everyone feels like this, but I, I think it's a fairly healthy human thing to carry around to not completely trust ourselves, right? And to want to interrogate our memories and want to interrogate our interpretations. And I think that's really useful and healthy. I think I can take that to an extreme. Um, so for people like me, I think having something happen like what happened with me with um, when I, you know, had Eric Idle some randomly kind of come out on Twitter and saying, you know, she was right. She, you know, it's amazing. No one was killed. She was in danger many, many times. That was incredible for me because I'm telling this story. I've told these stories many times about my experiences with working with Terry Gilliam but part of you, part of me at least, can always hear the other person's point of view. I mean, I think it's especially um, exaggerated if people are having memories that involve parents or authority figures. Is you know, the the voice of the other person can be louder than your own. So somebody stepping in and bearing witness and validating something is so incredibly powerful in terms of just being able to trust oneself and be able to. Um, take ownership of one's own memories and and I think a more firm way. Because the essays in, in this collection address what you've described as some of the most dangerous stories in your life, the ones you've avoided and the ones that have haunted you. And for instance, I mean, and then this is maybe a good moment to talk about such a what was a very troubling me memory and one of the most distressing in the book, your experience with the former CBC radio host Gian Gomeshi and how you did or didn't deal with it. And here, I mean, thinking about what you've just said about hearing other voices corroborate, I mean, it's you went through such a, a, a long anguish process 
in trying to determine how to engage with it. I mean, for years, you, you turned a deeply disturbing episode into a, a funny party story. Do you understand why that was? I do, because I think it's really, really typical um, behavior after an experience like this, that people will try to normalize it. They'll try to make a funny joke about it. They'll try to just assimilate it into something resembling normal life because it's too jaggedy to carry in its current form. So I think, you know, often, you know, there's that thing of, of fight, 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 flight, freeze, or fawn, you know, and then that idea of the, the fawn being added to that, which wasn't something I knew at the time, really makes sense to me of the numbers of times people will have um, at least, uh, you know, cordial, if not ingratiating um, interactions with the person who has hurt them um, later. And that always is really bewildering in a court of law. How could this ha have happened if this person subsequently behaved in such a friendly way to this person who supposedly did this thing to them? But in fact, it's more common than not that in order to sort of normalize something or try to process it in a way that doesn't make you have to live with it in its reality, you'll make a funny story of it. You'll be ingratiating. You'll be friendly. Um, but it's very, very hard to understand from the outside, I think, if you haven't been traumatized in that way. I don't think I'd heard that the, that last one. I mean, fight, flight, freeze, or fawn. I know fawn is a big addition to that, which yeah. Annette told me until I think well after I wrote this essay. And, and I think it is more common than not. Yeah. As you've said that the intention of, of, of your essay, The Woman Who Stayed Silent, was to show how difficult it is for women to come forward, to, to shed a forensic light, as, as you put it on your own experience. What finally brought you to that point of examining not just the trauma you experienced, but your own behavior afterwards? Um, you know, I'd been thinking about writing that essay for a really long time. Basically, from the time this story became public, I wondered about coming forward. I had a newborn and a toddler at the time, and I didn't feel that my mental health, from what I understood of what the process would be for women coming forward, would be able to withstand that at that time in my life. But I kind of always knew I was going to have to put up my hand at some point, especially watching what those women went through in a courtroom. And I thought, you know, what is it that I can even contribute at this late date? And my sense was, well, most people who experience this kind of thing don't come forward and we don't hear from them and we don't actually know what that process looks like or sounds like. But more people have experienced that than the ones who have come forward. And so what if I, what if I, you know, detail by detail went through my thought process about not coming forward and what that looks like and why women don't come forward generally and what it's like to go through a court process as a woman coming forward in this kind of a case. And, um, you know, the advantage that I had is I know so many lawyers and they were able to take me step by step through exactly what my life would look like for years after coming forward. And it was so horrific to me that the people that I knew, who I knew that knew the most about the system weren't going to advise any woman they loved to come forward. That seemed to be so broken to me. Um, so I really wanted to shine a light on that and what that process looked like. I mean, male power is also a theme of some of your films. I'm thinking of your adaptation of Margaret Atwood's Alias Grace and, and your recent project, Miriam Taves' novel, Women Talking. I mean, should we read anything into that or is it something that just comes with the territory when, when you're telling the stories of women? I think so. I mean, I think I am always interested in systems of power and how they might get disrupted and what it might look like to think of alternatives, which I think is something that Miriam does so beautifully in Women Talking is looking at, okay, like we know this doesn't work. We know this should be destroyed, but then what do we want to build? And the idea of like, what are, what are we building in the place of the systems that aren't working is for me, uh, such a refreshing place to put, put my mind as opposed to only identifying all the problems. Because, I mean, the idea of interrogation comes up a lot in your work. I mean, interrogating yourself, interrogating your own and other people's memories or versions of the same story. Why do you think that is? I think it probably started when I was really little. I think I come from a family of interrogators, not always friendly. Um, <laughs> so I don't think anything is allowed 
to just be stated and left alone ever in my family. So I think there was constant, constant playing of devil's advocate. I mean, to an exhausting degree. Um, so I think that comes natural. I think now that, you know, I don't live in my family of origin, they still live in my head. Um, so there's that sort of interrogation that follows me around. Um, but I think also, I'm just really curious. Like, I just really want to know. I really want to know someone, why someone's feeling what they're feeling and how and why and why they think that. And, you know, I think, um, yeah, I don't, I think I'm sort of like compulsive, invasive question asker. That's sort of, <laughs> that's my thing. <laughs> <laughs> because I, you're, I mean, because in the opening of, of your documentary, the, the stories we tell, sorry, in the opening of your documentary stories we tell, as as you prepare to interview your siblings, you say it's an interrogation that we've set up, and I mean, to the siblings, in, you're in in the in the documentary, you're you're the interrogator. Is it a role that you claimed within that family? No, I wouldn't say so. I would say that would be my older siblings would definitely have taken that role. So maybe that movie was my opportunity to take up that mantle. From a very young age, you've said writing was something that you liked to do. Was, was it also a vehicle for self-examination? I don't think when I was, I mean, I started writing a lot when I was six and seven. I remember my grade two class, my, my grade two teacher just let me write all day, every day. I don't think that it was about self-examination or revelation, but it was certainly about examining darkness. All of my stories were really, really, um, there were villains and they were heartless, you know, <laughs> and they did things without, re there was a story called Madman Orange and he just like flew around and he, and he just would drop dynamite on all these other vegetables and fruit for absolutely no reason. And it was really, really funny um, and you were kind of on Madman Orange's side. This is actually, I would like to do the rest of the interview about Madman Orange, <laughs> my best character. But I was just thinking about it. Like it, it, it's weird how I was really fixated on the idea of people doing bad things and why, you know, I think from a very early age. And have you interrogated yourself about that? No, but I will after. But, but wait a second, you, wait a second. You've, been, you've been in analysis for what, 20, 25 <laughs> years and you never have probed that area? No, it's just come up now. This could end in tears. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I have been accused of being a shrink monkey, so. <laughs> and then you just leave them at the end of the interview to do yeah. the record. <laughs> Um, you dedicated this book to uh, your grade two teacher who you say, let you write stories all day long, as long as you would read them to the class. And she predicted you'd be a writer. This one's a writer. How did the class respond to, well, Mad Men at Orange or, or just the darkness? of? I of remember your, them your... being riveted, but that could be my imagination. <laughs> I think that that held their attention. I mean, I think that it was such a great project she gave me, you know, because she could tell that's what I wanted to be doing. And it was a way of giving me something to work towards and it she had that amazing gift that some adults have which was to really take the kid in front of you very seriously and at the same time give them all of the space and allowances to be a child um and she did that so skillfully and so i felt like i took myself seriously you know at an age where i think a lot of people don't get that that feedback i think she did that for all of us actually because as you continue to write, did, did you have models or inspirations? I mean, I read somewhere that in your early teens, you read all of Charles Dickens and D.H. Lawrence. I mean, that's quite a spread. Yeah, I was, you know, it was so random the way I read when I was a kid, because I spent summers in this house alone, you know, in Aurora with my dad, who would be out all day golfing, I think, or something. And I would just wander around this big old house and look at all his bookshelves and I would just pull things out. So you know, one day I pulled out Pablo Neruda's memoirs and that, and that led me down a path of Latin American literature. And then one day I picked up a D.H. Lawrence book and then I read all the Bloomsbury group, but it was so random and so kind of just directed by chance the way I read when I was a teenager. Um, and I'm kind of trying to emulate that with my own kid because I have a 12 year old who really loves reading interesting and challenging books. And I find myself trying to curate and then going, no, like, just let it go like you don't know where this is going to go it's so much more fun to just see where it leads them and what random chance brings them books I, I can I can understand the impulse to direct though I mean I would just think like can you just flip uh, this book in? <laughs> like are there, or are there things that that they read that you maybe 
aren't so happy with or like no I mean I feel like they're just reading books like some of the books they're reading are books like I can't necessarily get through which is humbling um but it's amazing to have you know to have like a reading partner who you know you can sort of explore go down I mean I'm reading stuff that I'd never read before through them which is really really fun I'd like to talk a bit about what you've described as your boundaryless childhood. Did you feel special as as the baby of the family? I mean, you're the youngest of five. Or did you claim a lot of attention, or or you? Yeah, I did. I mean, I felt very loved. I did grow up feeling very loved, and um, it was you know there weren't rules, there weren't routines in a normal way, there weren't boundaries, there wasn't necessarily always a sense of safety. I would say, you know, things felt pretty chaotic and a bit wild west. And in many ways, I think I was more raised by my teenage siblings than my parents, which, you know, is a mixed bag and would be with any teenagers raising kids. Um, but I did feel like a basic sense that my parents really liked me and that I was really great. And that sounds so basic, but I think it's taken me a really long time to realize most people don't get that and what a huge uh, advantage that is and what resilience that implants in a person. Like, I think if you have that in those first few years, even though I didn't have my mom for long, I think that can get you through a lot. I think it's a lot of gas in the tank to feel like your parents like you. And I, I can't believe the number of people I've met who the first um example they can think of of someone who treated with them with any kind of respect or warmth or love is sometimes like way on in life or maybe it's a teacher a lot of people just don't get that at home so I think it made everything that followed after my mom died um I don't want to say bearable exactly but um survivable when you say they liked you you mean are you making a distinction between like and they loved you or or thinking yeah both. I am like that beyond beyond just like loving me because I was their kid I felt um appreciated I did I felt seen and appreciated did you were you a, a bit of an entertainer so that they would like you or do you remember that being part of I mean I remember it in my childhood in fact so I'm not <laughs> pointing fingers wait were you you had to be an entertainer was that part well, of I don't know if I thought I had to be but I tried to be <laughs> <laughs> did it work uh, I don't know you'd have to ask <laughs> <laughs> I want to know reviews <laughs> what did you get from the Russian judge um I feel like uh yeah so there was that which I think is separate from this which is yes there was a pressure to perform and be an extrovert and be charming and funny all the time um, which got me a lot of approval, which feels a little bit separate from love. But I feel like what I did feel was that what you got credit for in my family wasn't like being a good little girl. It was like, did you stand up to that teacher when they said that thing that you thought was really unjust to that other kid? You know, did you create, did you, were you a troublemaker in the best possible way? Um, I felt like, like that really garnered attention um as opposed to just not being much trouble which i really um am grateful for in retrospect i mean f following your mother's illness and death when you were 11 i mean every, everything changed for you uh, it was just you and your your grieving father your older siblings had left home your relationship with him was complicated as you've described it in in what way I mean, it just wasn't a parent-child relationship by any stretch of the imagination. He was declarative about that. He would say, you know, I, I want to be your friend, not your parent. And so he was. So I had an amazing person to talk about books with and to talk late at night with. But, you know, he didn't parent. I mean, he didn't even really provide basic <laughs> needs. Like, I mean, we lived in complete squalor after my mom died. Things just fell apart. There were multiple infestations of many things at the same time. Um he didn't really know how to, you know, just practically move through the world. My mom had done everything for him. So, yeah, I mean, life really fell apart. And I guess I was, you know, neglected. And there were conversations amongst teachers about whether or not to involve children's aid. And it was a big deal. Um, but he was a basically nice guy, you know, and he really loved me. 
and really engaged with me on an intellectual level, um, which doesn't make all the rest of the stuff okay. Of course, there's like tremendous damage that comes out of all of that, that lack. But I also had this other thing that, you know, was kind of an amazing thing to have a dad who like really wanted to talk to you about what was on your mind, um, who you had so much, you know, in common with in a way. Um, and he was delightful. Like he had a delightful brain and he was really smart and really funny. Um, he just wasn't super great at being a parent, which he would have admitted as himself. And when you were 14, you moved in with your brother's ex-girlfriend. Was that something that you were you were able to do? Was it to dodge family services? Was it a way of dealing with that? Or was it gutsy, it seems to me, to leave home at that, at that age? Well, we lived in Aurora, so it was about an hour and a half north of Toronto. I had to commute to school every day. Um, I was very isolated. I had no friends there in this really objectively disgusting house at that time that had completely was falling down around us. And um, and so it was an escape, I guess. I was escaping downtown to be closer to school and my friends and a clean place where someone might notice if I had eaten or not. Um, and the bed sheets were changed every now and then and laundry got done. And um, so it was a big, big change for me and a really positive one. You describe your mother as a as a very vital woman with a busy career as, as an actress and casting director. What are some of your best memories of her? Mm. I remember her coming and taking me out of school in the middle of the day and taking me down to Young People's Theatre to see a play, which when I look back at her life and how hectic it was, because she was the main income earner, she worked crazy hours in the film industry. She was the only person who cooked and cleaned and drove. And she had five kids. Um, we, and we lived far from, I mean, it was just the most, banana. we had no help. Like there wasn't the money for like any help with anything. Um, it's amazing to me that she made that kind of time. I remember her sitting down and playing with me, jiving with me. Um, jiving, she, uh, jiving dancing? Jiving, jiving, and, yeah. Dancing. She was really good at jiving. Um, and she was super uh, physically demonstrative and affectionate. So I just remember the warmth of her body. She was, her laugh was incredible, um, but she just had a real joy around life and a real love of people, like a very deep appreci appreciation for people in all of their forms. Like my fav one of my favorite stories about my mom that I think captures her so well is she was in Montreal at a bar and she saw at the next table, Leonard Cohen was there. And so she was like, oh my God, I want to go meet Leonard Cohen. I'm going to go introduce myself to Leonard Cohen. And so of course she goes over in a way like I would find absolutely mortifying. And she went over to Leonard Cohen, introduced herself. And she said, the friend who was sitting at the table said she came back with this huge grin on her face. And her friend said, oh, was, was he really nice? And she said, no, Leonard Cohen's a complete asshole. <laughs> And she was just sort of thrilled by even that, you know, it's just like whatever people were was thrilling to her. And he was kind of a dick to her, but that didn't like throw her off. That was just like more stuff and information and something that happened in the world. And I just love that, um, that sense of not needing things in to, to fit into a category to enjoy them that she had. So yeah, that, those are my memories that I'm, that are coming to me right now. Do you remember the play she took you to? Um, yes. What was it? It was, um, Jacob Tutu and the Hooded Fang. <laughs> in, in your essay, essay titled High Risk About Becoming a Mother Yourself for the First Time, you experienced dangerous complications in your pregnancy that led to hospitalization and a high-risk delivery. But it's also about finding a new and, as you say, different connection with your mother. What What can you tell me about that? I mean, I think a lot of people experience this where you you sort of live within the criticisms of your parents and then you become one and you you see a different angle on them. And um, I think for me, what became clear was, you know, I had lived with this sense of lack that, you know, my mother had died when I was 11 and that is tragic. And it was kind of apocalyptic for me because everything fell off the rails after after she died, there was no other parent to pick up the pieces, really. Um, but I think that I carried that narrative of a lack for so long. And then now I think I live more 
and quite genuinely with a sense that it's incredible to have had 11 years with someone who was that loving and who was that warm and who um, did bring that much joy and and sense of love everywhere. And so it changes into a story of of being very grateful I got that at all. Again, because the older you get, the more you realize most people don't get that even for a year. Um, so it's actually quite a lot. The body, your body, your relationship to it is very much a theme of these essays, uh, some of which document a series of debilitating physical ailments, often invisible ones, uh, endometriosis, scoliosis, placenta previa, concussion. Has it seemed, or I mean, have you felt betrayed by your body? Have you? Has it seemed unfair that you've had to deal with so many challenges? Um, no, I haven't felt that way. Maybe because I've had um, at various times, really good support. I think I've had, for the most part, um, those things have kind of happened at times where I've had supportive relationships. So that makes a really big deal, makes a big difference. Um, but yeah, I mean, when new stuff comes up, I do have like a moment of an eye roll going like, aren't you done yet? I've done with but, but from from the people in your life. Or... No, for myself. I mean, probably for people, but certainly for myself, I'm like, you know, I feel I've dealt with all the subconscious roots of this trauma. Does it have to manifest itself physically again? And then you're like, no, this is actually just a physical problem. <laughs> this is it. Um, but yeah, I mean, life just kind of keeps coming at you. And I, I certainly have people in my life who have had much more difficult time um, with illnesses and disabilities. And so um, it doesn't feel... Uh, it, I don't feel like I walk around with a sense of unfairness. Mostly I'm grateful that I got through all of those things so far. And, and the new ones, you think oh, another chapter, another chapter, another. Yeah, I've got another book. <laughs> another, book. <laughs> another book brewing, unfortunately. <laughs> I mean, the title of your book, Run Towards the Danger, relates to advice you got for treatment of, a con of concussion symptoms that affected you for more than three years. And, and and this this cure in order to fully recover that you needed daily exposure to anything that had traditionally triggered symptoms or caused you pain. In other words, to, to run towards the danger, it became a way of being that that led to the writing and publishing of this book. How does that work? How did how did it give you the courage? Well, it was such a paradigm shift. I mean, when you have a concussion, you spend so much time, if you're given the wrong advice, kind of listening to your body and resting when you're tired and having naps in the afternoon and avoiding things that trigger symptoms and not going to be too social and trying to avoid overstimulation and kind of turtling in order to avoid the things that would stimulate symptoms or trigger symptoms. So to have this really new advice from this doctor who I went to see about three years in, which was no, you know, run towards the danger, go into environments that bother your brain, exercise when you feel terrible, don't lie down, keep going. Um, and that's the only way you're going to get better is by heading straight towards the things that are causing you discomfort, because your brain has become weaker at doing those things and needs practice. Once you start doing that in one area of your life, and I had to do it so intensely with my concussion, it was like boot camp it just kind of naturally filtered itself into the rest of my life. So, okay, like what else am I avoiding due to discomfort? What else am I missing? What else am I hiding in a protective shell instead of reading and dealing with? Um, I think that that then I kind of was looking at all these essays that were half written and stopped basically because of a lack of courage and because of how uncomfortable it would be to have them out in the world. And what would that mean? And what was I gonna have to deal with? And it made me go, okay, well, it's possible that it's actually just as painful to have these left unfinished and to live in that state of fear than it is to just expose these to the air. Um, so I think one thing did really inform the other. And and what has it been like for you to to expose it to the world to 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 share such personal experiences, observations? It's actually been such an amazing experience. I, I read this James Baldwin quote recently, and I'm not going to get it exactly right, but he it, the gist of it is, in order to have a conversation, you must first reveal yourself. And what's been amazing for me is what people have come back to me with and what people have shared with me 
as a result of hearing about the book or reading the book, I get to hear people's stories, which you don't get to do unless you make the first move in terms of vulnerability. Um, so I've heard incredible stories of loss, of um, concussion recovery, of um, people processing assault, of people losing parents, of being of being parents. I've really gotten to hear so many incredible stories that have been so um, nourishing for me and inspiring for me. So it has felt like the best case scenario. None of the things I was really afraid of came to pass. Writing for film seems almost to have come as a surprise to you. I mean, you once told me how you had an idea for a short film that you made in your brother's house and it, it just came to you and you hadn't thought about writing for film before that and that it wasn't any good, but that it made you happier than anything you'd ever done. What was it about the medium that that drew you in? You know, I, I lived inside it for my whole life. So it was a language I kind of knew. Um, I had friends at the time who were directing um, and I just had this idea of something I wanted to express. It's, it's not a good short film, but it was something I really wanted to express. And um, and I really figured out that's what I want to do through the process of doing it. I had a bunch of friends and a lot of old crew from Avonlea showed up for me, like the grips and electrics and the care and the DOP were all literally like people who had been with when I was a kid. So it was like a whole bunch of family coming back. I remember Stu, who was the head of Panavision at the time, Stu Aziz, who had been my focus puller like or the focus puller on road to Avonlea when I was a little kid pulling up in a van with all this free equipment. You know, I think everybody like out of guilt was throwing me resources, <laughs> all my sound stuff done, people were crying. Like, so it was this amazing thing of, of this community coming together and me just very slowly figuring out that even though it was so hard and I didn't really know what I was doing and the film I made wasn't very good, nothing had made me happier than that intensity of collaboration. So I, I really learned by doing it. And your 2012 film, Take This Waltz, was an original story, but your other features or miniseries, and as in the case of uh, Alias Grace, have been adaptations of work by some of Canada's literary masters, Emmy Carol Shields, Alice Munro, Margaret Atwood, Miriam Taves. What draws you to a particular project? Where does it begin for you? I think it's always sort of weird and instinctual, and I can never really explain why I'm drawn to something until it's done. Um, but yeah, it feels like almost animal, like I'll be able to look at all of these ideas for projects and, you know, put them all up on a bulletin board and go, which should I do? And I can make pros and cons list and try to think academically about it. But ultimately, there's just something you have to do. It's like something you need to explore, something you have to learn about yourself or even just about why you're so drawn to it that just kind of pulls you. So, I, I mean, I think I am generally more drawn to adaptations just because I love walking around inside of books and it's such a tangible way to do it. Um, but yeah, I can never really tell why something actually has that urgency and why another thing doesn't. And you, you began acting at such a, an early age and, and as we've heard, you had plenty of reason to sour on that world that you knew so well, but you were able to make smart choices for yourself, working with very talented directors uh, in, in the independent film world. I think I read somewhere that you you asked every director you ever worked with for one piece of advice when you decided to make your own film. But were there particular directors or experiences that inspired you? I mean, yeah, a lot of them. I think Adam McGoyan was huge for me because, you know, he does what he does so humanely and so thoughtfully. Um, and I loved the way he communicated and he really mentored me in so many ways. Um, I loved working with Isabel Coichette. I thought she was amazing. Um, who She did My Life Without Me and The Secret Life of Words. Um, so that was really inspiring to me. Yeah, there were there were quite a, I had I did have as much good look at luck as I did bad, even though I, it doesn't make as good a book, good book to write about the good luck. Although I read a little bit in there about Jaco van der Maal, who made Mr. Nobody. And that was, I think that was after I'd made my first, after I'd made Away From Her, but he really showed me on that set, how possible it is to be completely humane and put people first and still do a good job. In, in the preface to Run Towards the Danger, you write that you've been far luckier than these essays might 
mm -hmm. suggest, but also experience more trauma than you've given chapters to. And of course, immediately I wonder like, like what, but are there stories <laughs> waiting in the wings? Yeah, I mean, I think there's like a lot of, there are a lot of essays I'd still would like to write one day that I didn't feel ready to write right now. But for me, the purpose wasn't to just, you know, create a list of traumas or a bunch of essays about trauma. Like for me, the connective tissue between all of those stories is recovery. They're all about ultimately recovery and the way the past is held in a different way in your current self um, than it was then and how, you know, who you're, who you are now and how you move through the world now can actually change your relationship to your past so that there's this dialogue between the past and the present. So that's, I think, what each essay in this collection is really about. Um, and uh, yeah, I don't know. I mean, I have ideas for essays I'd like to write, but I don't know what the connective tissue between them now would be. And, and you're now working on a novel? I am, yeah. Very lovely. Very <laughs> lovely. <laughs> Uh, uh, something I, I mean I almost never ask which is what next uh, uh, either the, I mean I understand the novel and you don't necessarily want to talk about what what is going on within that uh, other projects things that you're thinking about hoping There's for film project I'm also writing right now that I'm kind of curious to see where it goes um, it's uh it's a very loose um, adaptation of a classic work set in a contemporary time. Um, but I'm, yeah, I'm a long ways off with it. This would be something that you might direct yourself if, yeah. if okay. so it's it, not, yeah. What are you reading now? I'm reading My Friends um, by, I'm going to blank on his name. It's so excellent. I'm looking Oh, Hisham him. Matar. Yeah. It's so good. <laughs> He's terrific. Have you read his earlier books as well? No, I haven't. The Return and uh, yeah, no, he's great. I will though. Yeah, it's amazing. What, it's, you? what are you reading right now? <laughs> I'm, I'm reading. Uh, I'm reading for the uh, the jury for the uh, chair of the jury for the International Booker Prize. So I'm reading oh, a whole bunch of books that I can't say what they are yet. <laughs> but, okay. And one last question from me is just: What's the most traumatic thing that's ever happened to you? I'm just joking. <laughs> fortunately, fortunately, not this conversation. <laughs> good, good. It's always a pleasure. Thank you so much. Thank you so much.